All right. Um, and then, so the, this is our agenda, Rebecca, and this is what we're going to be talking over today. And I, I'd like to start off with saying what I really love about our agenda is how a couple of the titles sounds like a, uh, a, a dystopic youth adult novel. You know, <laughs> the emergence, the convergence, the divergence, <laughs> lightning right. round. No, so what we're going to do, Rebecca, uh, we're going to talk first about what we mean by the Venn of counterespionage. Then we're going to go very briefly into uh, definitions on counterintelligence sure. and insider threat. Uh, some people in the audience have been doing this for 20 years. Some people have been doing it for less than 20 days. So we want to put everyone in an equal playing field. To go into this. But really the meat and what we're really going to get into today is when we're talking about insider threat and counterintelligence, what's different, but really, most importantly, what's the same? Um, and of course, then at the end, we're going to do a, a lightning round, which uh, you I'm ready. completely unprepared I'm for. Ready. I'm ready. I'm going to. I'm duking this out. Yeah, she's, she's competing for the for the belt, the uh, championship of the world. Yep. Um, but the other thing that I want to bring out is um, why. Why is this important, and why are we doing this? And the the reason why uh, there, there's multiple levels, but first and foremost, um, it's about uh, the tools in your toolkit, right? And right. knowing what you have. Secondly, it's also about reporting and knowing where things report and uh, knowing which bucket things go into. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any? I do, and so I think for we have a lot of security professionals that are joining us today, and it can be a little bit confusing. Wait, is this a CI thing that I'm reporting to? Is this an insider threat thing that I'm reporting to? And uh, I think what we're going to show today is how strong that overlap and support is, not only between CI and insider threat, but between both of those disciplines and all of you out there in the security realm. It really is your reporting, your awareness, your engagement, that makes either of these an effective program. Sure. Um, and I also just love that you invited us here today because I hear that question all the time. What do you mean insider threat? CI has been doing that forever. There's nothing new about insider threat. And I think as we go through some of the slides that you've put together today, um, and also when I smack down in the lightning round, <laughs> you're going to really understand the difference and where um, you know, the new insider threat programs take absolutely nothing away from CI, uh, still have the traditional role, especially in what we're talking about today, counter-espionage. But insider threat programs are trying to get there ahead of the problem sure. before espionage ever occurs, and we need uh, CI to come in. So I, we'll, we'll get into it. I don't want to um, get ahead of our slides. But a really timely topic, I think, for everybody who maybe has that little bit of confusion or not sure where they fit in as a security professional to support both of the programs. Thank you. So can we get to the next slide, please? So a Venn diagram, for those of you unfamiliar, is when we take two topics and show uh, where they're different and where they converge. And it's, we we're trying to make the perfect Venn diagram, and it already existed, as you can see on the left. However, the second greatest Venn diagram of all time. We settle. We, yeah. we settle for second, and that's fine. Uh, is looking at your counterintelligence awareness and reporting uh, in one bubble. The other bubble is your insider threat hub, and in the middle is where we're really going to be talking about counter espionage. And the best way to really get into what do these things mean and how does this translate to counter espionage is to talk uh, a few definitions. First. Okay. And so, uh, and this is. This is the very, very slightly boring part of the presentation, but take a sip of coffee and uh, you'll be fine. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about counterintelligence, we're talking about um, inform um, information collected or actions taken in order to detect, deter, deny, degrade, disrupt um, uh, an adversary from one of their goals, which would be either espionage, sabotage, or some other uh, intelligence collection. And then specifically when we're talking about counter-espionage, we're really talking about that those factors of counterintelligence to detect, deter, deny, degrade, disrupt uh, that we do in order to stop a spy, right? To stop the bleeding um, and, uh, and to prevent the loss of information or, or, uh, or other assets. Um, so that was, that was pretty easy. So we're going to go on. That's pretty good. So that's counterintelligence, and it's a, you know plays a vital role. 
uh, especially in um, preventing our adversaries from getting an advantage of one form or another. And I think as your def uh, definition of counterespionage shows, a lot of times those actions are perpetrated by insiders. So this is where an insider threat program comes in. And if you can switch to the next slide, um, there are a lot of definitions of insider threat out there. Depending on where your program sits, whether you're in a federal agency, whether you're in a DOD component, whether you're in cleared industry, there are slight variations on the definitions. I think the one you pulled up, I don't have my glasses on, it wouldn't fit under the wrestling ma ma uh, mask, but uh, I think it's the NISPOM definition, which is a good one. And uh, they're, they're all very similar. Basically, the idea is an insider threat is someone who uses their authorized access to either wittingly or unwittingly cause harm to an organization. And that harm can come in the form of um, the resources of facilities, of personnel, or of information. Here's where we see some of that uh, coordination or um, convergence with counterintelligence. So you're looking to protect classified information that might be, or information related to the national defense that might be transmitted uh, to an adversary. And um, we look to protect that information when it's an insider perpetrating that exfiltration. You can see another definition that Ed put up there, and that is the counterintelligence insider threat definition. There are specific policies related to counterintelligence and insider threat, um, and it really talks about that point where we're trying to stop uh, the espionage or other related national security crime activities. Um, and then I think the last thing you have up there is what an insider threat program is. And so again, insider threat is nothing new. Counterintelligence has been addressing the insider threat for a very long time, but an insider threat program takes a really different approach. So our goal there is to get left of boom, uh, to intervene hopefully before a problem occurs, whether it's espionage or any one of the many other ways that an insider threat can manifest. Um, insider threat programs are these multidisciplinary teams. It includes uh, legal guidance, uh, cyber, HR, all the security disciplines, law enforcement, and critically, counterintelligence. And those teams work together to hopefully uh, identify folks that are maybe having an issue or presenting risk, risky behavior before a negative event occurs and to mitigate that risk. And oftentimes the way we do it is by hanging out with our CI friends who are on the hub and uh, rather than duking it out, working together, and uh, coming up with mitigation strategies that will protect not only the individual, but the organization. So yeah, we look for those positive outcomes, want to have um, get people back into a more productive uh, work environment and protect them and their privacy and civil liberties. But when we're unable to come up with a positive outcome, um, insider threat programs work really hard to protect you, to protect your assets, to protect national security. And often we do that by hanging out with our CI bros. Thank you. Sure. So we're going to go to the next slide. And as you see this chart, I'm going to explain this uh, quickly for the audience, especially for some of those that may have problems reading this. See in the right-hand side, we have a chart uh, that has got six bubbles all touching a uh, central bubble. That red central bubble is the in insider threat potential risk indicators. And Rebecca was talking about uh, insider threat has multiple um, inlets uh, for information. Uh, so go around the horn here, and we have a, a key uh, legend at the bottom. Uh, but we're talking about counterintelligence is mm -hmm. one of many injects. Uh, we're talking primarily about what I talked before of with counterintelligence. We're looking a lot of times at your foreign intelligence enemy mm -hmm. threats. We're looking at um, espionage, uh, espionage sabotage, or other intelligence collection activities. As we go around uh, clockwise around the circle here, cybersecurity, right? And, and so cybersecurity touches insider threat in a, a myriad of ways uh, as well uh, when you talk about um, actions that are happening on a network. Uh, I worked at a company years ago where uh, we actually had an IT person, um, information technology person, that every few months would rise her stock in some by putting a virus on the on the network so she could clean it up, right? Um, uh, That's why that user activity monitoring <laughs> is important. Exactly. That's one of those insider threat program requirements for sure. Exactly. 
Uh, next, we have LE, and that's for law enforcement. Yep. And this is uh, this is federal, state, and local, and uh, things that are coming in through there. Uh, and these could be things from um, from arrests, uh, mainly arrests, you know, uh, drug, alcohol abuse. These types of things would be going into the uh, Insider Threat uh, Awareness Hub there. Um, and then next is HR for human resources. And so this also encompasses legal. Sometimes we see legal as a, as a separate mm -hmm. deck, but we're going to lump them together for today. And this, this manifests in a lot of different ways. And again, correct me where I'm wrong, um, but uh, this manifests in a, <laughs> oh, you will, um, manifests in a lot of different ways. You know, one good example is through uh, performance uh, evaluations, counseling. These are the types of things that, that will feed in. Uh, of course, then we have um, SD for our security department, and, and this encompasses things such as uh, security infractions uh, that, that may be happen happening with an employee. And then finally, your medical or mental health issues. And that, um, these are things, again, this could be substance issues or mental health issues or other things that... And, and critically about that, it's undiagnosed and untreated, right? Exactly. So there's plenty of folks who have um, medical or mental health conditions and they've gotten the proper treatment and they're addressing it appropriately, that doesn't increase anybody's risk. That doesn't make them an indicator at all. So we're just talking about where these perhaps have been un unaddressed. And uh, so you're, you're absolutely right. These are all um, ingestive information that come into that insider threat hub, and that's super critical. You know, one of the things that uh, sadly we're commemorating this September is the anniversary of the Navy Yard shooting. Um, and that was a situation where you had an individual where there was lots of information out there on his risk. He had very concerning behaviors, but it was never brought together in one place and, and evaluated appropriately so that countermeasures could be taken, not only to maybe um, get to him before he committed a negative event and get him back on a positive track, but also to protect people. Uh, uh, just a, a, a big uh, opportunity lost there. So what an insider threat program does is give an opportunity not only for all of these sources to bring information in, but for all these different uh, disciplines to sit together and evaluate it and come up with good uh, mitigation response options. So yes, they are sources of info, but they're also sources of response and support. HR can bring in uh, employee assistance programs to help individuals. Um, Cybersecurity, if somebody's being you know, targeted or clicking the link can find ways to prevent that from happening on that on that particular computer. If somebody's being targeted or elicited by a foreign intelligence entity, CI can come in and find ways um, to to minimize that risk and and put countermeasures in place. So these it's a two way flow, right? So not only does Insider Threat get information in from all these people, but they take their advice in developing a, a very holistic mitigation response option. Thank you. Um, and so I think this would be a good time to talk a little bit about some examples where uh, CI would diverge from the insider threat and insider threat would diverge from okay. CI. Uh, we're really going to make our money uh, when we talk about where they where they converge, but let's talk a little bit about some examples you may see. So sure. one, one good one is uh, you're at a conference and you're solicited by someone, possibly a foreign power. Um, uh, and you report it. Um, and that, that is something that is more along the lines of uh, a straight counterintelligence uh, type of concern to report. Now, similar incident, you're at a conference, I see you getting solicited by a potential foreign power, you don't report it, I report it. Is that an insider threat, Rebecca? Yes, yeah, it so, is. Right, so it's all about reporting. And I, and I love your first example, so, and, and some people may say, well, hey, that foreign targeting uh, solicitation is happening to an insider, so it's an insider threat. Insider threat programs are looking for risk behaviors or behaviors sure. of concern. Somebody who is solicited or targeted or, or even suspects that that's happening and reported it is, is not committing risk-based behaviors. That is exactly what you're supposed to do. Could you report it to your insider threat program and they get it over to CI? For sure. Uh, could you report something of insider threat concern to CI and they get it over to insider threat? For sure. I mean, the, the key thing here we want is please report this information. But just because you were targeted and did the right thing doesn't mean that anything pops that, you know, you have a behavior concern or elevated risk. Did everything right? Um, one of the things CI might do in that scenario, though, is 
uh, or an insider threat program might do is give that person a, a new CI awareness briefing right. so that they understand, hey, you did the right thing. Here's what might happen next if these guys pursue you or other ways you could protect yourself. So it really becomes, again, this holistic way that we resolve a problem, whether the problem is internal or, in this case, it's FIE. That's the problem. Right, and so this is a good time to also say that when you talked about you know a CI brief, we have these on cdsc.edu. Rebecca gets paid by the click, I do. so make as many clicks as you can. She I wish, I wish, kids. I need a new minivan. A minivan, <laughs> eleven years old. Okay. Um, so another quick example I'd like to go into is uh, at a foreign trade show, uh, being surveilled or um, or a search and seizure, or your hotel room is tossed. Not necessarily an insider threat concern, something you definitely need to be reporting through CI channels. Um, and then another one, give, giving a cyber example, is uh, a brute force attack against, uh, against your network by APT1. APT1, of course, being the group that the Mandiant Report uh, outed, uh, Advanced Persistent Threat 1, outed in 2014 as uh, an agent of a foreign power conducting, conducting cyber operations against the U.S. government and, uh, and industry. Um, these are all things that are more along the lines of, of a CI concern. Now, I would say with that last one, yeah, your, your cyber people would all need to know about that, right? right? You know, so, right. so again, this chart's not perfect because we would have all of these touching each other somewhere. Um, but, um, but I would like to talk a little bit about uh, where insider threat examples that are generally not CI, sure. not CI concerns. And I say generally because you can what if any of these scenarios. Absolutely, that, right? absolutely. Um, and so a workplace violence event, someone, an uh, employee punches another employee. Um, right. And that, so that's, uh, you know, with CI we're looking for things with a foreign nexus. <clears throat> with insider threat we're looking for behaviors of concern. If those behaviors of concern have a foreign nexus, that's great. We, we're tied into CI. If it's something like workplace violence, we're tied into um, HR, law enforcement, uh, behavioral science, and mental health who might address that kind of an issue. So um, definitely falls on that side. Now, it's unlikely that that's going to end up with a CI kind of mitigation. Sure. But uh, who knows if that workplace violence was directed by um, a foreign intelligence entity or an adversary, sometimes inspired by it. We've had some CT cases that we know of out there um, where there, that node comes in. That's the cool thing about an insider threat program. That hub Everybody sits around together and looks at cases and makes that determination. It's often hard to know, just as the layman, when an incident occurs, if there's a foreign nexus or not, right? That's something that a CI professional can identify. And so getting this information out there for the whole hub to review and CI can take a look and sometimes identify places where there's a foreign nexus that nobody else even realized that there was. So that's one of those cool things about uh, even though I'm talk we're supposed to be talking about divergence here, I'm still talking about where we come together. But, but again, very, very rare that a workplace violence issue is going to get a CI mitigation. So we have an incredibly hard question that came in um, okay. that, uh, that I'm going to challenge you with. It's not that incredibly hard. But uh, who would you contact if your human resources was complicit in covering up an incident that involved a security manager? So that's a great question, right? And um, I think whether it's uh, HR or somebody else, or you have an issue with somebody in the insider threat program um, or in the CI program, there are a lot of protocols out there for folks to address um, governmental activities that are inappropriate. Can we, can we talk about a whistleblower right now in that, sure. in that role? Yeah. So this might not rise to the level of that. You can go to others in your organization, your security officer, your leadership, your key management personnel. You can go to, if your organization has an inspector general, if they have an office of general counsel, there are lots of roles there you can go to. But there is also a whistleblower program out there. And I'd like to draw a very bright line, if I could, between a, a legitimate whistleblower, somebody who follows appropriate protocols to, um, uh, to shine the light on inappropriate governmental activities, uh, versus somebody who commits some sort of unauthorized disclosure. So somebody who follows all the protocols and procedures is a whistleblower and is not in any way, shape, or form an insider threat or a CI concern. Fair? Right. Right. So um, what can't happen, though, is you can't disclose classified information to somebody without an authorized need to know 
and then later, after the fact, come back and say, oh, I was whistleblowing. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You have to follow all the protocols and procedures from the very beginning. Um, you can learn more about those on CDSC's website. We have an unauthorized disclosure toolkit that gives all kinds of links and resources for uh, going down that route and different ways to do it. But um, again, so to answer that person's question, I don't know if that rises to the level of a whistleblower, but if you didn't get relief in some of the other areas I was talking about, senior leadership, legal counsel, inspector general, others, um, you can certainly go to that uh, No Fear Act and Office of Special Counsels and others that can help you do that. Thank you. Okay. Well, one more example. Um, Unsafe practices due to a drug and alcohol abuse in a workplace. Again, far less likely to be of a counterintelligence concern, but much more likely to be of an insider threat hub concern. Totally. And we had one more question. This one's a little long, but, um, but it's at, I, I actually really like this. When an insider threat unlawfully releases classified information out in the public domain, but where a foreign intelligence entity is likely to access it, is that strictly insider threat, or is that likelihood sufficient to establish a foreign intelligence nexus. I would tell you this is clearly an instance where this would be this would be a both, right? Where for sure. um, that uh, you would definitely need to counter intelligence professionals. Uh, you know, especially when, when we start talking about things of, you know, the damage assessment and everything like that. Uh, what was taken, what's uh, what's missing from your networks. Um, and again, we're not trying to make this into a, you know, you either tell this person or this person. The no. the intent is, you know, the um, you know, getting the right people involved early on will help um, massage this entire process. And the key is reporting it, right? So yeah. nobody's going to say, hey, dummy, why did you come to Insider Threat with that? You should have gone to CI, or vice versa. Right. Nobody's going to say that. They're going to say thank you and work with you to gather more information. We need this reporting. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting to see these divergence and convergence where things might come in one door and be handled one way or the other. But that's the whole beauty of this is we work together now. Since, since this new policy came out, it really brings all those notes together. And not just CI and insider threat. That example that our viewer just gave is a big information security breach, right? And so there's information security protocols, unauthorized, unauthorized disclosure protocols that have to be gone through. Um, if you can't prove that it's a, a ultimately a, a CI thing, that would be a law enforcement issue, though, to prosecute that unauthorized disclosure. So there's all kinds of pieces that touch it. Cool thing about Insider Threat Program is we, we have that hub group working together. Cool thing about CI, though, is they know this. And if that were to come in their door, they would make sure it gets to the right place. And so the other, the other key part to this is we've actually seen this happen uh, quite a lot, you know, with information on uh, forums and uh, you know, dark web or deep web uh, that as that information is getting out there, you don't know who's looking at it, right? So you have, right. to, you have to make You have to assume it's gone. That it's gone, right. Somebody just put, popped up, and I'd just like to answer it real quick. They asked, is the DOD Inspector General Hotline another resource? That's a great resource. Um, for those of you who are not in the DOD, um, there are, there are probably hotlines associated with your organizations, um, and you might have a, an ethics reporting line or something like that in your company or in your federal organization. So that's what those are designed for, and they also are pretty good at triaging and getting you to the right um, place for a resolution. Right. So I hope you're not getting nervous because we have two more slides before we get to the lightning round. So, okay, you're, yeah. you're lulling me into complacency so I don't do well in the lightning round. I see what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. So now we're going to talk about the convergence. And so there are a lot of areas in which insider threat and counterintelligence. And I feel like we said them all yeah, in the divergence yeah. slide because it's so, <laughs> it is so well tied. Right. So, so some of the overall areas, we're talking about supply chain is one. Um, Foreign intelligence entities, which we've talked about already, uh, insider-enabled cyber, um, the uh, uh, poor security practices are all big areas of overlap. Absolutely. And um, so, let me let me give a few examples out okay. there, and I'd like to talk through. Okay. Um, an employee clicking on a link to uh, a malicious um, uh, from a spear phishing email from a malicious uh, to a malicious link or a malicious attachment. Right. Clearly, this is something where it's both. And you know what? 99% of the people that do that are doing it because uh, they're not paying attention, not necessarily because it's they're unwitting. Right. They're not necessarily witting, but that then puts the onus back on, um, you know, 
back on the, the security apparatus to make sure those people are trained right. Right, and know not right. to do this. And, you know, I get it. I've seen some just phenomenally well done spear phishing uh, emails. They can be very uh, tricky. It's not just, you know, the guy who won the lottery and wants yeah. to put the money in your account anymore. They're, they become very sophisticated. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, my favorite one is getting uh, emails from Bank of America instead of Bank of America. <laughs> yeah. Um, I recently had one from the Bank of Taiwan that wanted to transfer <laughs> information. It, it was not really the Bank of Taiwan. But uh, it was just, it was, I thought, a clever twist on it. <laughs> Kudos to you, adversary. Um, so colluding with a competitor or a foreign power. Uh, and so this is pretty recent in the news when you think of uh, there's just been a court case about uh, an employee from uh, Tesla that uh, got up one day, walked out, walked to a new job in China and took a whole bunch of proprietary data. And there's, you know, um, very, very interesting court case to follow, right? And so... Um, but clearly that foreign nexus, clearly sure. CI, it's an economic espionage issue. Um, but also was perpetrated by an insider. So clearly insider threat program. And I think you can see why, um, when this policy came out, why they even came up with it, right? right? So the idea was we were sort of handling all these things in silos. We're often handling them after the event has occurred. So after the uh, U.S. employee takes things overseas, then, hey, CI's on it or law enforcement's on it, we're getting it. What We want to get there before it happens, when there's indicators that this guy's going to get up and leave, that he's been downloading proprietary information. And that's what an insider threat program, working with CI, helps you do. Another example, surfing adult content on a work computer. And so this blurs the line. Um, so first of all, it's vulnerability, right? Um, it um, and it's, it's a high risk factor, especially when you're talking on the insider threat. But um, yeah, a lot of companies also employ something called BYOD. For those of you that are, don't know what I'm talking about, BYOD is bring your own device, which means bringing your personal computer and using it in your workspace um, and conducting work off of it. Now, if you are conducting risky behaviors on your personal computer, and hey, I'm not the morality police telling you. No, you I mean, surfing do, adult sites is not an insider threat indicator at all, exactly. at all. Let's clarify that. But, but on a work computer right. or one that can introduce a vulnerability into your work environment. Roger, exactly, thank yeah. you. Um, and then finally, knowingly or unknowingly purchasing some par or tampered with components. And this is what we were talking about with supply chain. Yeah, uh, really good point. Um, and there have been a lot of cases, uh, and they're, they're actually corruption cases recently, where we've seen folks getting kickbacks or doing other things, and that they can degrade the final use or the final product, and that is absolutely an insider threat, uh, not necessarily the foreign nexus. Sometimes uh, it might be, but it's still uh, impacting the warfighter, impacting um, the quality of the materials, and especially if it's coming from overseas, we don't know what kind of backdoors have been put into those uh, products or components. So definitely that CI and insider threat convergence. Definitely. Um, and I think we have a good question. If you okay. Wanna, you can try and answer so uh, one of the audience has asked, how do we as security practitioners ensure derogatory information is properly reported for an employment candidate who resigned from their previous job to avoid getting removed? This is such a good question, and it's something that we have seen come up again and again, folks who will maybe job hop, um, who will quit before they get fired so that there's not that paper trail. Um, there, there was actually a great case study that Army talked about uh, just on Monday, somebody who had had the same kind of issues, job after job after job, but it wasn't reported. So just because you lo lose jurisdiction from somebody, if this was a cleared individual, you still need to enter that information in JPASS or whatever the system of record is. Um, and, uh, you know, again, whether it rises to the level of a disqualifying factor for their eligibility is, is a determination made by the vetting directorate and the adjudicators. But having that record in there is critical. When that individual um, shows up somewhere else, that, that element that you put in will be adjudicated. Um, and uh, when an insider threat program gets reports of con behaviors of concerns or other things, they're able to aggregate this information and say, you know what, this wasn't an isolated incident. We have a pattern. We have it documented here. And then maybe they can address the issue. That doesn't mean necessarily not hiring the person or 
removing their eligibility for access. It means getting the help they need to resolve the problem so they can stay in. If they can't resolve it, can't come up with a positive outcome, rest assured the Insider Threat Program will work with personnel, security, CI, and others to do what it takes to make sure you're safe and your organization is safe. And this is why the NISPOM reporting requirements in 1301, uh, 1302A, and B are so important and so critical important. for us and everything. And 1302A is primarily uh, adverse, information. adverse information. And so, and for those of you who are not subject to the NISPOM, as I know probably many of you are, you have other reporting requirements. So the 5240.06 for DOD folks, um, it's the CI awareness and reporting statute, but it gives three categories of information that have to be reported. CI targeting, insider threat indicators, and um, cybersecurity indicators have to report the information. Um, also, there's the insider threat policy for DOD 5205.16 that also requires reporting of these indicators. Um, and then for those of you in the federal government, you're subject to EO13587, which requires reporting of just this kind of information. And it's to address exactly the issue that our very smart audience member brought up, is people have found ways to slip through the system. That's why we have insider threat programs. It's meant to address those, those very issues. So are you ready to go to the last slide before the, uh, yes, before the lightning Yes, round? I'm so ready. This is, this is your last chance to duck out of the room. No, so. no, no, because I'm going to take you. I got my mask. I got <laughs> my belt. I got some water. I'm good. <laughs> All right. So uh, just talk real quickly defense. Now, when we talk um, on counterintelligence, uh, detect, deter, deny, degrade, disrupt. Detect, deter, deny essentially is what we're pushing for, for cleared industry. Um, when we're talking about insider threat, we're talking about detect, deter, mitigate, right? Because it's risk-based. We actually say deter, detect, mitigate. We like deter to come first. OK. So because we, we want to, um, of course, if there's an issue, we want to identify it, detect it. We want to mitigate it. But what we'd rather have is no issues at all, right? Sure. We want to do that deterrence, and that's the, the, one of the very critical roles that we do in insider threat programs is that deterrence. And there are a lot of different ways we do it. A lot of the ways we do it is by working with our counterparts on the hub, CI, security, HR, um, mental health, law enforcement, legal, in order to come up with ways to, um, to, to prevent people from ever engaging this behavior or, or help them get the help that they need. Um, when it comes to mitigation, um, you know, that role is really where we get that convergence again with CI right. or with some of our other partners. So a mitigation response option, I think a lot of people misunderstand. Insider threat programs don't conduct operations. They don't conduct, you know, big CI investigations. They don't prosecute people. They don't get people out of access for security. What they do is work with that hub team to come up with a mitigation response option that might include some of those, but those are going to be executed <clears throat> by those who have the lawful authority to do so. So CI denial um, operations or activities are going to still be conducted by CI, not by insider threat. Right. We just worked with you <clears throat> to get you the information you needed. <clears throat> I'm getting choked up because this means so much. <laughs> I really love this. Um, you guys, we work with you so that you can have it more effective operations, investigations, et cetera, as well as support your efforts to deter and detect, right? So if we detect something, we're going to let you know. Uh, we work together on that deterrence factor, et cetera. Um, and we're, we are focused on CI today, but we really work with all the other disciplines when we come up with those mitigation responses. And one more thing I'm blathering on, but I just want to say, the, the mitigation response options are individual sometimes, so you have a specific activity, a countermeasure, an intervention that's going to help an individual, the person that's committing the act or um, uh, exhibiting behaviors of concern. But you also have organizational mitigation responses that can occur, and it's where during the course of, of uh, looking into this incident, we decide that, you know what, there's some serious vulnerabilities on our information systems. So yeah, we're going to handle this person who brought porn into the office or whatever, but we're also going to readjust our settings on our overall network so that we're stronger. Right. Um, and so those kind of organizational responses are really what help build up the deterrence factor for the future. Right. And I think, and 
as you can see from the slide, um, and I'm not going to read through these. These are all just some good examples of things you can do. But what you just talked about was continuously reevaluating after yes. an incident happens. Reevaluating. Really, the best person to talk to about these is either your uh, your, your counterintelligence person, and for for our cleared industry folks, you know, in our, your IS rep or your CISA are people that you can talk to about incorporating some of these things. Of course, training and everything, um, but. When I say training, don't just rely on, you know, just the... Uh, the Annual awareness, fantastic, check the box. Yes, check right. the box things, but you know, we have the vigilance campaign for where sure. we have a program out there for uh, throughout the year, little things that you can do. We have micro-learns, webinars you can look at, uh, shorts, all these other things. And there are other sources out there, too. Um, the FBI has got some fantastic they products do. out there. NCSC has some fantastic products out there. So all different things that you can, you can use. Um, and one and of the cool things about our toolkits is that they bring in those resources from other organizations. So you have kind of a one-stop shop. The CI one does it. The Insider Threat one does it. Where if there's really great stuff out there by the Bureau or by um, CISA, DHS, or whomever else, we kind of collect it for you. And then, like Ed said, we have these vigilance campaigns. So month by month, uh, lots of little things you can send out to get people engaged. Um, it really is a partnership with our security professionals, and I know that's a lot of who's tuned in, that all of that deterrence and detection is really based on uh, their good work. So we try to put together stuff that can support them in their efforts. Roger. Well, thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to the lightning round. All right. I'm ready. All right. I'm ready. I'm going to win. So this is how it's going to work, everyone. So uh, if you can see from the slide here, and we're going to ask you to participate from home uh, where you can. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and there's four possible responses. Is it a CI-only concern? Is it an insider threat but not CI concern? Is it both, or is it neither? And we're going to ask 10 questions, and Rebecca can defend her answers. So the first one. OK, yeah, I can't see it. Read it to me. I'm someone, ready. Someone clicks on a link or opens an attachment in a spear phishing email. OK, so I have to tell you whether that's CI, whether that's insider threat, or whether that's both. Right. That is both, baby. That I, is I, both. I would say that's both. What's the audience say? Yeah, the audience did, uh, did fantastic on this one. Nice right? job. And now, there's a few people that disagree. And I get it, because all of these, like you said earlier, there's a lot of what ifs. So if you know they reported that they did it by accident and completely addressed it and whatever, you 100%. know, that's, that's different than somebody who didn't know they did it. Uh, do remember, too, though, that the insider threat can be unwitting, an unintentional yeah. error. And that, that's a lot of what we see. All right, number two. Number two. Number I'm two. feeling good. Do this. You find a tuft of cat fur in some muffins you bought at your company bake sale. OK, so what if a foreign intelligence entity knew that your coworker was allergic to cats? Right. And they paid you money to put the cat hair inside the cupcake. That we've seen a lot of suspicious contact reports on that. <laughs> All right, that's neither. That's neither. <laughs> yeah, we're going to say that's neither. Okay. Um, but it's, it's awful. Oh, no. It's disgusting. It's what just it, don't yeah, do that. And what if that person was just doing it to, to have like a, a form of workplace bullying or something? It's all context dependent. But we're going to still call that a win for me, that my answer was correct. Yes? No, definitely. And, okay. and, I, and I pulled this from a personal experience in first grade when, uh, <laughs> when, the, when the bully actually for Valentine's Everything Day. Everything he I, needed to okay. know, folks, he learned in kindergarten. <laughs> Next. OK, number three, right? We're on three? Right. A state-sponsored uh, computer network exploitation actor or cyber actor launches an SQL attack on your company's or, or agency's server, SQL being structured query logic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that solidly in the CI camp. You know, that's not something where the insider enabled it, at least not in the scenario that you pr presented. Right. Now, if it turns out later that it was based on poor security practices, winning or unwitting, uh, or other risky behavior of the insider, then we can pull it back in. 100%. But otherwise, I would say that's squarely a CI concern. I would, I would agree. And then if you think about the hub that we showed earlier, you know, your cyber guys are also going to want to totally. know this. Totally. Or right? and, and, and your cyber people. Yeah. are going to need to know this as well. Um, That's the cool thing about the Hub, though, is that we can, we can uh, workshop those what-ifs and be like, you know what? In this case, the foreign intelligence entity did not provide the cat hair. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's you know, we're all going to send this home. Or we can say an insider was not related to this, or they were, and that way, and then it gets to everybody who needs it, the cyber guy, the information security guy, whose stuff might have been targeted. 
uh, Insider Threat Program, CI, whatever. Okay, sorry, question, number four. Question four. A disgruntled employee engages in workplace violence. So again, that's one that's going to squarely fall in the realm of insider threat, at least for this uh, cage match. Uh, but I'll say from the insider threat perspective, then we're going to, it's going to be both but with other people. So that's going to bring in our HR counterparts. That's going to bring in potentially our law enforcement counterparts, our physical security at our organization, whatever. Um, you know, uh, CI probably won't play a role in mitigating that particular part of, of that risk. Right. Um, so, you know, again, you could wet it forever, but that's going to squarely fall for insider threat. Our fifth question, you are, you are four for four so far. And so how's the audience been doing? Have they been pretty much matching up with us? Yeah, they've been, they've been doing All right. fantastic. All right, cool. So, uh, an, employer, or an employee is making suicidal get gestures and is, being, and is reported for that. Okay, and so uh, that's definitely, again, going to squarely fall in the area of insider threat. Although I'd like to point out there's a few people out there saying neither. And I, I will say that uh, while uh, I get where you're coming from, that that's a, that's a personal matter. It's not posing a risk uh, necessarily. Um, you know, people are our greatest asset. They are our greatest resource. And uh, particularly in DOD, for those of you who are participating, <clears throat> it's not a small problem suicide. Um, it's something that the DOD has really been contending with, particularly with veterans. And one of the successes that we've seen in insider threat programs is the ability to identify those expressing suicidal ideation and intervene before they harm themselves or others. Um, we owe this to our veterans. We owe this to each other. And um, insider threat programs, because they have those multidisciplinary resources, can very often intervene and get people the help that they need. So uh, we take it very seriously in the program. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you know, we're, we're targeting somebody or anything else, but we're, that's, a, that's a risk of harm that we care about, and, and we can find ways to intervene. Now, again, not going to fall under CI, but just to clarify, the, the neither answer wasn't, I, I get why they said that, Roger. but we really, really can make a difference. And we want to continue to have that positive outcome for folks. And I know it sounds impersonal when we call someone uh, an a asset. A resource or an resource. asset, right. But, um, but uh, you know, at, at the very human level, you know, we want to, as you were saying, we want to ensure that we're taking care of all of our people. And to include them, you know, as an asset of being able to carry out the mission. Right? For sure, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think the phrase that we, we used to have here was people first, mission always. And... You know, when somebody's in that kind of space, it's, it's frankly however the insider threat manifests, right? So harm to self or others, counter espionage, fraud, theft, uh, workplace violence, some kind of uh, um, sabotage, um, those indicators are often the same in the very early phases. And it, it might be hard for you to know whether somebody's going to end up spying or, or killing themselves. There's a famous case, uh, uh, John Walker, who said, and there's a video of him saying, I saw myself as having two choices, pulling out the 45 or selling the information. You don't know how things are going to ultimately turn out. It depends on all kinds of individualized factors, personal predispositions, motivations, access, whatever. Um, let's catch it in the early phases before any harm is done to any resource. So you're at a... Uh, I totally brought us down. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you're just stalling. You're stalling. Okay, I am. I want to I get 100% though. I like question, getting an A. Question six. Reporting that you were surveilled at, while attending an overseas trade show. Okay, read the question again. Alex? Reporting that you were surveilled at an overseas trade show. And you can, you can look at the audience's response. I get to throw a friend. So I'm going to say, what is CI only concern? I would, say, I would agree with that, and, yeah. uh, and the reason being is this, is this is something that you're reporting, right? And this is This is the behavior that we yeah. want you to do. So it's not of concern to me that you report it. It's just that's, that's what we want, um, and it doesn't mean that you are exhibiting any kind of behavior of concern or risk just because you were targeted. The fact of the matter is we are all targets, uh, every single one of us, by virtue of being an insider, by having that authorized access. So when you recognize that you've been targeted and report it, dang, that's good. Roger. Yes. And so then I'll flip it on its head for the next question. Okay. Now, failing to report uh, that you were surveilled and solicited at an overseas trade show. That is 
both, baby. 100 yes. percent, right? Yes. And so it's um, the idea that uh, you are not reporting suspicious contacts. That's, right? a, that's and, uh, a behavior of concern right there. That's right. an indicator. Um, and, uh, you know, if other people observe this, right, you, they have no idea that maybe you said, like, no, 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 not interested, and you didn't think it was a big enough deal to report. That's a good right? point. Um, yeah. And you never know what, the, uh, what other people are going to interpret from that. You want to be reporting these contacts, again, as per uh, the DISPOM and uh, 1301. A and B, or 302 A and B. Yep, and, and as per 5240.06, so if you're not subject to the NISPOM, you have a requirement to report those kind of foreign contacts. And it really um, helps the CI program to understand uh, what our adversary is collecting, what they're interested in, what their methods of operation are. That information comes in, and we're able to devise it to get our national CI strategy and everything else only based on your reporting. So if we don't know what's happening, we're not as aware of the threat environment from a CI perspective as we could be. That way we don't have as good a countermeasures and we can't do the denial uh, activities that Ed was talking about. So we, we need to know those things. It's a huge help. So, um, so we're doing good. The audience is doing phenomenal. Uh, some of these questions are getting a little trickier. Okay, um, okay I'm ready. Question eight. Let's go. Uh, selling your programming job to a foreign actor that you don't know is a spy. Or even if you knew that they were a spy, selling your programming job. Right, right. So is it, it's okay if I didn't know they were a spy, <laughs> exactly. that they can go ahead and do my job from overseas for a third of the rate that I'm getting paid? I'm going to say that is both because we've got the foreign nexus Roger. and the insider, yes? 100%. And okay. this, is, this is a true story that has been out on the news. Uh, it's, a, it's a few years old. Uh, you Google the term uh, Verizon Bob. They did a fantastic job of, because they did a great insider threat, um, you know, once they recognized the problem that, hey, why is all this malware uh, from, from this foreign country coming into our network? Come to find out an employee had uh, sold his programming job for $50,000, sent his security fob over to, so uh, a programmer could access the network. Uh, actually got awards for how good his programming was. Um, and uh, when they found out what was happening and they started doing their investigation, and this is all out there uh, open source that uh, this employee, Bob, was going to work every day and they had a list of what he was doing, spent a few hours looking at cat videos every day, which... That cat hair question. <laughs> exactly, that's where it comes from. No, um, you know, looking at Reddit, doing social media, and uh, sending not a report working. at the end of the day, not, report, not working because someone else is doing his job for him. But at the same time, you're, you're, allow, you know, you're an insider threat because you're allowing so someone else... To a few out. clever points for like outsourcing or whatever efficiencies, but the risks involved with that are phenomenal, right? And, and just beyond the cybersecurity risk, the foreign intelligence entity risk, right. all kinds of things. Um, yeah, good example, dude. Both. Yeah, Both. definitely. Okay, what are we on? Question nine. So we've got two more. Okay. Um, this one, and so staying late at work and working weekends, unexplained affluence, high use of the copy machine, and several security infractions. Okay, so um, here's the thing about this. This is a tricky one. You're good. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to caveat all over the place to save my answer here, right? <laughs> this is what, this is what smart people do. Um, so first of all, Every single thing that you mentioned, or I think most of them, um, <clears throat> can be mitigated in some way or another, right? So every single one of these, you could sometimes say neither. Because I'll tell you what, I am busy as could be. I sometimes stay late. Sometimes I work on the weekends. I do it a lot just to keep up with what's going on. Um, that doesn't necessarily make me a threat or a behavior of concern for me because it's typical behavior. So if it's anomalous behavior for somebody or it's unexplained, not tied to their work, okay, then we've got an issue. Um, one of the other things was what? Unexplained affluence? Roger. Okay. So it hasn't happened yet, but my fingers are totally crossed for that lottery win. <laughs> and um, I could come in with that new minivan we were talking about finally, and you'd be like, hey, where'd she get that? Uh, but it's but, the horse minivan. No, I right, got it. Right, right. So, but I had, um, you know, a reason for that money. Security violations. Now, again, it depends on the nature of them, but if you've worked in security for long enough, I mean, eventually you forget to lock a safe or something gets left out or things happen. Right. Um, so what's the nature of those violations? Are they egregious? Are they 
uh, people didn't self-report things that they did or didn't, you know, were, were completely cavalier about security or whatever. So that's all on one side. So, but let's say that in, in every case it's not mitigated away. These are unexplained or, or um, nefarious actions. Um, I'm going to have to say uh, both. And here's why. You didn't mention a foreign nexus with any of those. But of all the potential risk indicators that exist in insider threat, there are subsets of those that are clearly known as potential espionage indicators. Right. We'll talk about that then of counter espionage today. And we know that people sometimes employ these as tradecraft, or they are evidence of somebody who is um, engaging in or could be engaging in espionage or other related national security crimes. And so um, I'm going with both. Okay. Um, what did the audience, audience say? I talked so long they were <laughs> uninterested and failed to respond. I'm sorry. Looks like uh, both. Both? Awesome. Ooh. Yeah, okay. fantastic. Okay, so yeah, very fantastic, uh, good answer. Uh, key thing being here is that any one of those separately or is something that can be explained away or talked about. Totally. The other key thing here is that they're all coming from different disciplines or domains. You could have security infraction that came from cyber. Yeah. You could have, yeah. or, 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 you know, or, or hey, you let piggyback, someone piggyback off you coming in uh, one day, um, and that would be more of a physical security concern. All these different things could be coming from different sources, you know, human resources. Um, and it's about getting those indicators together to see a bigger picture. Because you as a cyber guy may say, like, okay, well, he's... Whatever, uh, no big some, deal. Some, right. You know, like, that happens. People do. So Mr. Payne, the former uh, DCSA director for about a week and DSS for about three years, um, he was on the Hansen investigation mm -hmm. years ago. And uh, one of the stories that he would share was uh, during the investigation, they had the idea of, Let's look at luxury cars in the parking lot. And, uh, you know, so clearly, you know, it, uh, unexplained affluence, right? And that is a good indicator. But they went through the parking lot, and they're like, wow, a lot of people have really nice cars. <laughs> right. And they had to go into figuring out, um, you know, with, that, hey, there, were, there are reasons. There are they, valid they reasons behind it. Sure. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one of the last things about that one that was cool to me was that we said it earlier in the day, you often don't know um, whether there's a foreign nexus or not. That's the CI expertise. Sure. So some of these indicators, foreign nexus is not apparent, but your CI guy can either um, confirm or deny. He will neither confirm or deny. No, he will <laughs> confirm or deny whether that's a concern with that particular indicator, and that can guide where the mitigation goes. All right. Let's Last one more. question, and, uh, and then we're almost done. Um, a whistleblower using proper procedures. Oh, dude, we just talked about this earlier. A whistleblower using proper procedures is neither an insider threat or a CI concern at all. Follow those protocols. Um, I, I, you know, it's a necessary um, uh, function of our government that we have this whistleblower procedure. I have a lot of respect for it. All of those in the security CI insider threat realm do. Um, if you don't know what those procedures are, though, reach out. You're not going to be put on a list or anything. We'll help guide you to where you need to go. So that's the end. Uh, the audience did fantastic. We do have a question we're going to get to in a second. Um, but I wanted to first and foremost say, you know, you win the belt for, uh, yes. for Champion of the Universe. OK. Uh, uh, but Thank also you. the uh, the tag team belt here. So uh, as we go forward, you know, these we <laughs> need to do it I like the rock and just put it over your shoulder. I think I got it. Okay. Um, uh, no, things are getting more complex, and so we're going to need to see, we're going to see a lot more interoperability in between all these different uh, domains. No and doubt. So, and so, of course, CDSC, we've had uh, multidisciplinary webinars before, but right now we are the tag team champs because yes. it's the most recent. Uh, so I do want to thank everyone. Uh, we're going to take, take one last question, I believe. Um, so there are many minor security incidents that it would, uh, and I want to apologize because I'm not wearing my glasses today because my, my, four, my four year old thought that they could float down the uh, <laughs> down the stream. So. <laughs> Thanks, Dia. Okay, so as it says, there are many minor in security incidents that I would never know about as a security officer because it happened at my subject's previous command, lived and died in that local security file. Report to your insider threat program. Insider threat programs are designed to be that aggregator, especially in DOD. And if you're having concerns at your area, 
and you report up to Insider Threat, they will work uh, throughout the community and they work with the DITMAC, Defense Insider Threat Management and Analysis Center, which is a central repository for DOD, so that some of those um, older incidents um, get reported. And again, if there's a minor thing, it probably didn't lead to any kind of full-on mitigation response. But when we start to see the patterns over time, uh, then we can. And this is why the DITMAC was created. So I encourage you not only to report in minor incidents um, and let them be that repository and play their role, uh, but also if you have somebody of concern and you want to know about prior commands, reach out. Um, you know, the Army's presentation on Monday, one of the things they talked about is nobody calls references. Nobody calls the former boss. We make people listed. We don't bother. A lot of great information can be gleaned there. So doing that due diligence, working with your insider threat program, and just being aware of those indicators, CI, insider threat, cybersecurity, the whole spectrum, and making sure they go up uh, is going gonna, is gonna to really help us mitigate risk throughout the, our organizations. I'm done. Thank you. Do you have any other closing comments? No. Because uh, that said, I want to thank everyone for participating. Your participation has been great. Uh, feel free uh, to stay online afterwards and uh, fill out the survey. Uh, uh, we, we do look at all these comments. And uh, if you've got any ideas like, hey, you guys should